Ephesus. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands. We stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone will harm them, thus he is doomed to be killed. They have power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have no power over the waters to turn to them into blood and to afflict the earth with every plague as often as they desire. And when they have finished their testimony, the beasts that ascend from the bottomless pit will make war upon them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is allegorically called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. For three days and a half, men from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them to be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents. Because these two prophets had been a torment. But after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them. And they stood up on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And in the sight of their foes, they went up to heaven in a cloud. The word of the Lord. Presbyterian Psalm, blessed be the Lord, my rock. Blessed be the Lord, my rock.
gospel according to Luke. 
At that time, there came to Jesus some Sadducees, those who said that there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, having a wife but no children, the man must take the wife and raise up children for his brother. Now, there we are seven brothers. The first took a wife and died without children. And the second and the third took her. And likewise, all seven left no children and died. Afterward, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had, had her as wife. And Jesus said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are accounted worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. For they cannot die anymore because they are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now he is not God of the dead, but of the living, for all are alive to him. And some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you have spoken well, for the for they no longer dared to ask him any question. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to our Lord Jesus Christ now and forever. If you watched at the end of the gospel and as I was coming out for this reflection, the master of ceremonies decided to bring the stand here so that I stand under the sun to share your experiences. And I thank you, Father, for giving me this privilege to partake in the sufferings of my brothers and sisters. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the living God. My dear brothers and sisters, we congratulate the Catholic Charismatic Renewal of Nigeria on this Golden Jubilee celebration. We thank God who sustained us as a group and as individuals all these years. 50 days 50 months, and then 50 years. We thank God. We pray for the faithful departed, our brothers and sisters, who we are members of the renewal, those who worked hard and spread the Catholic charismatic renewal message to the ends of our country, Nigeria, and even beyond. We may all be renewed in body, soul, and spirit. 
is our prayer through Christ our Lord. We are in the month of November, my brothers and sisters. A time that we are always reminded about the end. You must have observed that in the month of November, the church in her liturgy constantly reminds us of the end. We start off the month of November every year, November 1, with the celebration of all saints, followed immediately by all souls. During the month, the readings from the book of Apocalypse, or the book of Revelations as we call it, point to the end of things. All these indicate to us that the church's year is about to end. Within this period, if you are born to Europe, you will see that nature makes it obvious that things change and end. The grass is fed away. Most of the trees lose their leaves. And even in this part of the country, during the hammer time, you understand what I'm saying. Imagine, you look around, and the greeny climate or vegetation is gone. You see only three trunks and no leaves. You look around. If you look at the center of the you will notice not just that the grass was cut, but gradually, gradually, the climate is changing. The dry season is gradually setting in. We are at the threshold of this change. Tomorrow is the last day of the church's year, the solemnity of Christ the King. I hope you remember. Yes, tomorrow we celebrate our Savior, the universal King, King of heaven and earth, and our own kings. It is only by making Christ the King of our lives that we can manifest his glory in line with the theme of your celebration. When I saw the theme of our celebration of this golden jubilee, I was so delighted and prayed God to give each and every one of us, members of the renewal, the privilege of manifesting his glory. Let us reflect briefly on the readings. If you read 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10, you will see that our Lord, Jesus Christ, abolished death. I have chosen, as the theme of our reflection, what St. Paul tells Timothy, which we used for the Alleluia verse. If you listen to what we used for the Alleluia verse for this Mass, our Lord Jesus Christ abolished death. Starting from verse 6 of that passage, the first chapter of the second letter of St. Paul to Timothy, Paul admonishes Timothy to fan into flame the gift of God that he received through the laying on of hands. He reminds him that God did not give us a spirit of timidity. As Paul reminds Timothy of this fact, he reminds each and every one of us here who have received the Holy Spirit of God, that God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but the spirit of power and love and self-control. Say amen. amen. Consequently, Timothy should not be ashamed of witnessing to the Lord. So also, myself and yourself should not be ashamed of witnessing to the Lord or afraid to go through hardship for the sake of the gospel. Relying on the power of God's grace, Paul continues that Jesus is the source of this grace which he had granted before the beginning of time, but only revealed by the taking flesh in the Blessed Virgin Mary and the, through his suffering and death. By dying, Jesus has abolished death. He has brought to light immortality and life through the gospel. This affirmation of faith brings together what the church presents to us in the first reading and the gospel. The connection between the first reading and the gospel. Bringing together, bringing together this new life that Jesus has brought to us. Let us look at the book of Apocalypse. Before we go into the passage presented to us from the book of Apocalypse or the book of Revelations, 
it is important to situate this book as a whole. We know that the book of Apocalypse of John is a difficult book. I know most of you who are in the preaching ministry, I wonder how many times you make use of passages from the book of Apocalypse or the book of Revelation. Even us priests, including myself, sometimes we dodge reflecting on this book, the book of Apocalypse. Why? Because unlike the Gospels that are straight stories, the book of Apocalypse is something else, which we must be very careful of in interpreting the book of Apocalypse. There are many symbols and images. For instance, in the reading of today, you heard of lamp. When you go through the book of Apocalypse, you hear of scroll, the seal, dragon, different beasts with horns and eyes, sometimes in unusual places. You hear of numbers, seven, 144,000. You hear of the number 12. You hear of 666. But these numbers, my dear brothers and sisters, are symbols. Colors are also significant. One of the images is that of the lamb that was slain and worthy to open the cell. The lamb that was slain and worthy to open the cell. It is important to note that these symbols are not arbitrary. These symbols you see in the book of Revelation are not just arbitrary. For example, the image of the lamb that was slain reminds us of the passage in the gospel where John the Baptist referred to Jesus as the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. You remember that passage? The gospel according to John chapter 1 verse 29. So, instead of speaking about Jesus, the book of Apocalypse speaks of the lamb that was slain. Speaking in symbolism. Instead of mentioning the name of Jesus, he talks about the lamb that was slain. Similarly, many of the images and symbols used in the book of Apocalypse are taken from the Old Testament or other Jewish literature. In the first reading of today, we hear that there are two witnesses, that is two olive trees and two lambs that stand before the Lord of the world. Revelation chapter 11 verse 4. I wonder what you were thinking of when you were listening to that reading. Two olive trees and two lamps, two lamps that stand before the Lord of the world. It will be a mistake to take the olive tree and the lamp literally as if the passage is talking about olive trees and lamps. This will be like taking the tortoise that feature prominently in Igbo folklore as if such stories refer to real tortoises that had power of speech. Those conversant with the Old Testament will immediately link this story with Zechariah chapter 4 from verse 1 to 14, where there is a reference to lamps and the two olive trees. The connection between the first reading of today from the book of Revelation chapter 11 verse 4 to what we have in Zechariah chapter 4 verse 1 to 14. Here in the book of Zechariah, lamps stand for the eyes of God, which range over the whole world. Anya ne ilo wanine. Anya ne ilo wanine. Woko boko ranya. Onye kaone yukuma kia. About God himself. While the two olive trees stand for the two anointed ones in attendance on the Lord of the whole world. In the book of Zechariah, the two anointed ones of the book of Zechariah were Joshua. Joshua, the priest, and Zerubbabel, the governor placing the state and the church in our context now, side by side. Joshua the priest and Zerubbabel the governor. It is actually with reference to Zerubbabel that God made the famous statement, the famous statement we quote from time to time, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6. That Zerubbabel was accomplishing the task of rebuilding the temple it was by the power of the Spirit of God that the governor, the king, had the powers to do the good works he was doing, including refurbishing the temple. In summary, my dear brothers and sisters, although images and symbols are used in the book of, book of Apocalypse, they are strange to us. But for the first century Christians, 
it was not so strange. They were conversant with such. Why then, one may ask, did the writer of the book of Apocalypse need to clothe his messages in a layer of symbols? Nowadays, people talk of speaking in tongues when they don't understand what somebody is saying. You may ask, why did the writer of the book of Revelation choose to speak in symbols? One has to note that Jesus spoke in parables too. Our Savior spoke in parables too. So it is normal for the Jews to clothe messages in symbolic language. Just as the Igbos claim that the Proverbs are the palm oil with which one eats words. But circumstances explain the extra layer of the symbolism in the book of Apocalypse. The book of Apocalypse and other writings in the apocalyptic literature were literary products of oppressed groups intending to communicate to the faithful ones secrets or mysteries. The writer introduces himself as I, John, your brother and partner in hardships. Revelation chapter 1 verse 9. The writer was speaking in tongues somehow, speaking in symbols to communicate secrets, messages that are not open to the uninitiated, those persecutors. The intention of the writer is to encourage his fellow partners in hardship to stand firm because their triumph is assured. In the book of Apocalypse, we hear of such affirmations as, Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. For instance, Revelation chapter 5, verse 5. Because he was slain and has gone through the same hardships that his followers were presently going through, the lamb is worthy to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. Revelation chapter 5, verse 12. It is this assurance of light at the end of the tunnel, of victory after the hardship, life even through death that provides the courage of hope that sustained the early persecuted Christians, for whom being Christian is equivalent to embracing death. At this point in time, being a Christian was equivalent volunteering to die, to die for the message. It is this paradox of life through death, lived out fully by Jesus, which is the mystery foretold before the world began, a truth hidden in plain sight, so that, as Jesus put it in Mark chapter 4, from verse 11 to 12, they will look and look and never perceive. Listen and listen and never understand. But for those granted the secrets of the kingdom, everything is clear. My dear brothers and sisters, it is my prayer that we are all among those who have been granted the secrets of God's kingdom. The secret that life comes through death in obedience to the king of the universe, the lamb who was slain. Another interesting question about the book of Apocalypse is why it speaks about the end and about heaven, new heaven and new earth. Why? This gives the impression that it is about when this physical world will come to an end. I remember in the 90s, before the year 2000, when there were the craze about three days darkness. Do you remember that period? Many of us here, I'm sure, secured our candles, waiting for the three days darkness. About the world coming to an end, let us remember that the book of Apocalypse is full of symbolism. Some people had taken the prediction of an end of the world, literally. And when the world did not end, they decided to end the world for their followers. You have heard of such stories. Those that predicted that the world will come to an end at a point in time, physical consummation of all things. And when it became clear to them that they were false or erroneous in their prediction, they decided to lock up the churches to destroy those, those people who were listening to them. That was the error of understanding the message of God. Yet this emphasis on the end of the world and the new creation distinguishes the book of Apocalypse and apocalyptic literature from the prophetic books. All the prophets of the Old Testament usually warned the Israelites of the impending punishment from God unless they repent. Repentance and faithfulness to the covenant guaranteed restoration. 
then and even now, my dear brothers and sisters, I repeat, repentance and faithfulness to the covenant guaranteed and still guarantees restoration. Restoration is often in terms of peace, security, prosperity, fertility. These are captured in Deuteronomy chapter 28. If you go back to the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 28, you will understand what life will be like within the period of restoration and reconciliation with God. However, with the exiles of the Israelites, the destruction of the temple and the loss of sovereignty, prophetic messages gave way to apocalyptic frame. Let us come down to what we said today about the two trees, olive trees and two lambs. Revelation chapter 11 verse 14. We have alluded to the possible reference to the two witnesses. Against the background of the book of Zechariah, the two witnesses may not be understood as two human beings, but as corporate personalities, the religious and civil establishments. The religious and civil establishments. The ministry of these witnesses is cast in the light of the prophet Elijah, who shut the heavens for three years. First King chapter 17, verse 1. And Moses, who turned water into blood. Exodus chapter 7, 14 to 25. And they struck Egypt with many plagues. Thus, just as at the transfiguration, Moses, Elijah, Moses and Elijah were seen conversing with Jesus. Matthew chapter 17 from verse 1 to 13. The witnesses symbolically represented as olive trees and lambs could be interpreted as the law, that is the civil law, and the prophets, religious. In this our society now in Nigeria, people are trying to compartmentalize, to divide between my religious life and my life in the society. Politicians tell you, we are talking of your well-being, making you comfortable, not about your religion or your relationship with God. I don't know whether you hear such statements and you should laugh at such people because they should realize that you are not divided body and spirit. You remain a child and disciple of God. These were attacked by the beast that comes from the abyss. This beast represents chaos and lawlessness. This chaos overran the law and the prophets. Possibly the writer of the book of Apocalypse was describing the existential situation of the Jewish people. Interestingly, the reference is communicated with symbolism. The corpses of two witnesses, it says, were left on the streets of the great city, known by the symbolic names Sodom and Egypt. As you listen to these readings, put ourselves in the picture of those societies, even the countries mentioned. Put our country, Nigeria, in the context of Sodom and Egypt. The message goes further to say that it was a city in which the Lord was crucified. Now, many of us try to crucify Jesus once more by our lives and conducts, by our denial of faith, by our neopaganism, syncretism. These ways we employ to, to crucify once more our Savior, if it were possible for us to do. The Lord was crucified in Jerusalem, but by referring to this city as Sodom and Egypt, the writer wants to project the immorality in the city, as in the Sodom. As in Sodom, where Lot lived. Remember the story in Genesis chapter 19. And the operation experienced in Egypt before the Exodus. The corpses were exposed for three and a half days, not letting them to be buried. This is unlike the Lord, who was buried and rose on the third day. But these corpses we are talking of were left unburied three and a half days. These witnesses were denied the burial and they were exposed half a day, longer than the Lord. Now comes the most amazing thing, my dear brothers and sisters. God breathed life into their corpses. This reminds one of the dry bones of Ezekiel chapter 37. This is a pledge of God's unfailing intervention which will bring a new and better life. An intervention that will rattle the enemies and one through which the just, those who persevere in their witnesses, will be exalted to the consternation of those who had persecuted them. 
you shall rise and your enemies shall be disappointed. Our first reading today ended with this invitation to the faithful who persevered even till death from which the Lord will raise them to new life. He says, come up here. That's the invitation coming from God. In spite of the persecutions, those who think that you have died, the Lord is telling them, I have abolished death. Those who trust in me will never die. Say amen. amen. My dear brothers and sisters, I have tried to painstakingly go through the first reading and trace the symbolism to their possible original sources for the purpose of interpretation. For the purpose of interpretation. This is to help us do the work, the hard work of getting the message intended by God to the original hearers or readers of the book. Often what obtains is that people either ignore the book of Apocalypse or impose their arbitrary meaning on the numerous images and symbols. One stands to gain deeper insight by walking through the symbols and images and letting the word of God speak to one instead of imposing one's meaning on the world. The key point of the first reading is that those who persevere in God are guaranteed the transition from this life to a better life because the lamb, because of the lamb who was slain. The joy is that we are the children of resurrection. We are children of the resurrection. All of us baptized. All of us gathered here as members of the renewal. We are all children of the resurrection. The reading is a statement of faith about the new life made possible by our Savior. Jesus who abolished death. Put differently, the death of Jesus changed the meaning of death. Yes, people will still die in the flesh. Because you'll be wondering, why are many people dying? Young, old, men, women. Yes, people will still die in the flesh. We have all been bereaved and know many who have exited this mortal flesh. But Jesus abolished death because by dying, he destroyed our deaths. By rising, he restored our lives. It is this new life made possible for us by Christ Jesus, which is the basis of our courage and the hope. To underscore the importance of this new condition made possible by Jesus, the gospel today engaged the Sadducees and their belief that death marks the end of life. They brought up the story of a woman who married several husbands and asked whose wife she would be at the resurrection. I understand, I know, I guess, when the reading was going on, some of us here may even support the Sadducees and the, uh, tell them, ask him, let him tell us. On the resurrection, which of the seven will claim this woman as wife? Their aim was to highlight the absurdity of the belief in the resurrection. 